mention that in the front by the sign-in sheet, there's a small yellow um, pamphlet that kind of details out how a lot of that's calculated. Hey, Shannon, before we move on, one other yes. question for you. So on the the amount proposed, uh, will cause Higley School District's primary property tax rates uh, to decrease. And so if you can help me understand, because it looks like, I mean, on the, on the initial slide for tax rates, mm -hmm. it looks like the actual primary property tax rate is going up from 5.16 to 5.34. And so how will, I just want to make sure that, that since we're having a public hearing on it, that we're not saying, is that a combined tax rate will yes, go down? Yes, it is combined. Yes, you are correct. It is combined. And then I have one other question to that, to that effect. Um, it, it seems like the numbers are off between the two slides. Because on slide one, we say that it goes down by $6.54. And on the other, it's seven eighty nine. And I assume since we're talking dollars and change, we're probably talking $100,000 on both. One second. I'm sorry, I misspoke at your previous question. Um, from what my understanding is, it is actually built into the primary tax rate. So it is part of the primary, not the secondary. So it's not part of the combined. Okay, so can you explain that a little bit more then? Sure. Just help, just help me understand and, and maybe anyone else. Sure. From sure. the first slide to that slide, how do we get from uh, uh, primary property tax rate going up to a decrease in that? Now I'm simply confusing myself. So, <laughs> so when I actually go back to um, the research that I did, it says that it is part of um, the combined, um, but that it. But it's based on the fluctuations of property values, and will not have a significant impact on the rate. Does that make sense? Am I answering your question? Uh, kind of. So, so uh, just to clarify, on the uh, slide that's up right now, uh, that is meant to meant to be combined. That's based on the combined. Yes. Okay. So that that does answer the first question. So okay. thank you. And then the second question, um, just is, can you help me understand? Because I'm assuming that from that tax rate slide to this one, we're talking about a hundred thousand uh, dollar home valuation. Correct. And so on one slide, we're saying it's $6.54. On the other, we're saying it's $7.89. Okay, so on the first slide with the, the $7, hopefully I don't go back too far. There. Okay, so on this slide, this is based on um, current cash and encumbrances and things like that based off of June's numbers when we submitted this to the county. On this, on the truth and taxation calculation, those numbers are, um, it's a formula by statute that explains um, these numbers if there were no other tax liabilities. So if it was at zero, these would be the calculations. I understand. Thank you very much. Of course, of course. Does that make sense to everybody? Not if I fumbled through all that. <laughs> any other questions on any of that? Okay, so kind of where we go from here. Um, Later on in the, in the board meeting, I'll ask for um, the adopted budget to be accepted. 
um, we'll, I'll have to upload that to the Department of Education in the county um, for approval and acceptance. And then basically the next revision will be in December of 2015. Any other questions? Oh, one more slide. Questions? Do we have any questions from the public? Thank you. We appreciate everybody being here. Okay, if we don't have any further questions, then we will adjourn the public meeting and reconvene into our regular meeting. We'll move on to 5.0, request to speak to governing board. We value input from our constituents. This time has been set aside for anyone from the audience who wishes to address the board. Please remember this is not an appropriate venue to evaluate, discuss, or criticize district personnel. Policy KEB provides a process for complaints about personnel. Members of the board may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to ARS 38-431.01H, action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter, responding to any criticism, or scheduling the matter for further consideration and discussion at a later date. Please limit your remarks to three minutes. I have two requests. If someone is interested in um, speaking, you may see Ms. Olivas and and fill out a form. So at this time, I will ask Mr. Colbert. Did I say that right? Colbert? OK. <laughs> Thank you. to discontinue general leave for part-time certified staff. Our contracts and obligations are identical to full-time staff, except for the reduced days, which the prorated salary F reflects. I am evaluated in the same way, using the same tool and with the same frequency as full-time teachers. I am designated as highly qualified, have a master's degree, and hold dual certification of special education and early childhood. I am required to meet the state mandated 180, re 180 recertification hours. The hours are not reduced for part-time teachers. At least five of the eight impacted employees have been with Higley less than eight years, which means any projected budget savings won't occur for several years, while we will be impacted immediately and for the rest of our HUSD careers. In my case, that impact means one day of leave each year for the next 13 years, one day every year for the next 13 years. Or when my leave runs out, regardless of my years of service, my pay will be docked to cover absences due to illnesses, family care, or unexpected emergencies. J.A. Combs, Gilbert, and Mesa allow all certified employees to earn leave while Chandler and Queen Creek provide the benefit to the .5 FDE and above employees. Like the current HUSD policy, each district prorates earned leave equal to the contract. In short, I have seen firsthand the positive changes in growth in HUSD over the years. I am actively involved with educating my neighbors and friends to support their schools, teachers, and school boards. I have voted for you, but for night, tonight, I need your vote for my future. Thank you. Thank you. Heather, is it Bach? Balch? Thank you. Good evening, board members. My name is Heather Balsh, and I'm a speech language pathologist here at the district. I've been employed with Higley Unified School District since 2002, with most of my time as a part time employee. For the past eight years, I have been a member of the preschool evaluation team, earning general leave. 
As a part-time employee, I have appreciated the ability to take time off work ne when necessary when I or someone in my family has become ill. In those cases, I, like most employees, have been able to use my general leave. As we all know, illness does not follow a set schedule and cannot be scheduled for days off. When I use my general leave, there is no additional cost to the school district for my position does not require a substitute. In the small number of part-time certified staff, several of us do not require substitute teachers, meaning no additional cost for the district for us to use general leave. As an HUSD employee, I am a highly qualified just as those peers. And I maintain continuing education hours to provide the best service for our families. HUSD strives to provide exceptional learning experiences for our students, and that is achieved by hiring and retaining highly qualified staff. Please continue to value your HUSD part-time certified staff and maintain general leave. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I don't have any further requests. So we will go on to 6.0, the superintendent's report. Dr. Thomason. Yes, good evening, Vice President Reese. Um, coming up, we have the first day of school in a little over a week on July 27th. Uh, students will be returning and will be starting and kicking off the year uh, at that time. We also have a governing board study session uh, and, and board meeting on Wednesday, August 12th and Wednesday, August 26th. So uh, that would be the upcoming events we have at this time. We have no other updates uh, at this time for the board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any board comments? Dr. Thompson, could you give us a list of perhaps the open houses and open curriculum nights that they have in the district as we get into August here? If they have something we could be of interest at 10, please. We, we do have the open houses. I'm going to refer that to Dr. Nance for the elementary schools. Dr. Nance, do you know when the open houses are for the elementary schools? I, I don't need to know right this minute, but if you could just give us a list so we Absolutely. have to attend, that's fine with me. I certainly will. Thank you. Dr. Nance, all of our Meet the Teacher nights uh, for next week for elementary is the 20... Elementary are next Thursday late afternoons. Um, I, I have the other ones written down, but I'm going to have to defer to our principals here to let you know when. I believe next Wednesday, 26. both middle schools next Wednesday. and So essentially uh, both middle schools next Wednesday, all elementary schools next Thursday, and high schools are dependent upon the year. Yeah, they're div I believe that two high schools are on different days, and I'm looking for a high school person, but I don't. I can get that to you. I'll get the information to you. I know for, yeah, I know for high school, it depends on what year they are and when they go. Exactly. So. All right. Any other board comments? I would just like to publicly thank our personal public personnel office. You know, I've told you a number of times, but I'd just like to publicly tell you how proud I am of your accomplishment and your staff and what they've done in, in recruiting the best teachers in our district. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on to 7.0, our consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve consent? Second. You want, you want the motion? Oh, no, they made a motion. Okay, and then I support. I motion we approve the consent agenda. I support. <laughs> Sorry. Perfect. Any discussion on the consent agenda? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Okay. 8.0 is old business. We don't have anything listed. 9.0, action and information items. For 9.1, adopt the fiscal year 2016 expenditure budget. Do I have a motion? I make the motion. Second. Any discussion on the budget? Uh, uh, Vice President Reese. 
<laughs> Mr. Hoffman. Just one quick point of information. You're not doing any uh, additional presentation on the numbers, are you? Okay. All right. This is the one that has to be submitted to the state by the 18th. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Can I just make a, a comment briefly? Um, as board members, when we approve of something, and I'm just really curious when, when a board member says nay, I think it's um, important for the community to understand why that vote is no and what the reason is for that. Certainly, although I, I reserve the right to explain my vote as, as I desire. That's but right. I'm happy to explain that one. Right. Um, so the, the primary property tax rate did go up on this budget. Um, now, we're able to achieve a net savings, a net reduction in that property tax rate. However, that's at no, uh, that's because of nothing that we've done as a board. That's not good stewardship. That's not effective fiscal management. That's because our voters didn't approve an override. And so we've stepped down a second year. And so the secondary drops. Um, and I think that it uh, flies in the face of our voters to simply submit a budget with a number that causes the primary to go up to maintain a fairly consistent level. Thank you. 9.2, establish eligibility of district employees for fringe benefits for the 2015-16 fiscal year. Do I have a motion? Make the motion. I'll go ahead and second that. Right. Any discussion? Vice President Reese. Yes, Mr. Sheila, can you do me a favor and just recap um, what the change here is? Um, Mr. Hoffman, I'll do my best to do that. I was just looking for the um, email that I sent kind of summarizing that. So um, at, the, at the present time, there are about eight employees um, that are less than a .75. Um, that has been what the district has defined as a full-time benefits eligible employee for some time period. Which, to be clear, is how many hours per week? 0.756 hours a day. Okay, so 30, 30 hours, hours a week. Yeah, yeah, 30 hours in a week. Um, I believe that when I sent you the, the update with the information, there were several of the employees who have elected to be at the FTE that they're at. They either want to job share, so they're a 0.5 and a 0.5, um, or just have elected for whatever reason not to work a full-time schedule and have requested that reduction. That's not the case with every single employee, but um, for the majority of them. Um, in addition, they have, they have been earning the leave at a pro rated rate. Um, so a 0.6 person, for example, earns 4.8 hours of general leave every single day of the week. Um, and so they would be allowed to keep that leave that they've accumulated. They'd be able to leave the leave that they use the leave that they've accumulated. They just would not be earning any new leave. So Sheila, it, it seems like if that leave is prorated already based on their uh, time in the job, right? Time in the seat, I guess. Um, it seems like that's already an equitable dock in that compensation. And so I'm just curious why on, on uh, certificated uh, teachers, right, or, or um, you know, evaluation people or whatever it may be, why we would um, want to take that down to nil rather than allowing it to simply be prorated. Because, um, I, you know, I do, I do have compassion for some of the, the speakers that have spoken and the emails that we've received. And um, it, it just seems like if we're already prorating that, that that would be equitable to the remainder of the staff. Right. Part of it is um, that, that unfunded burden should they leave. So once you're in the district for more than, eight, more than eight years as an employee, then upon leaving, then we owe the payout of the general leave. So I do think I also sent some sort of estimate with that with the current employees that we have, and I, I don't remember that number off the top of my head. But it's just like with any other leave time, that unfunded balance when we just allow that amount of money to accrue to a large amount if, uh, is one. Um, and I guess the other thing for me as, as director of HR, I, I feel like it's my job to look out for all employees, um, not 
to, to differentiate to a huge extent between certified and classified employees, and this is something that we've been applying to classified employees for a complete year now, um, many in the same situation. So it would be my recommendation to be consistent. So this is a policy that we approved for last year mm -hmm. that was implemented for one class of employee but overlook and overlooked and not implemented for the other when it should have been. So they've continued to accrue it after we approved the general leave policy um, accrual. So yeah, and I would and I, and I guess uh, Vice President Reese fair point I would push back on that just a little bit uh, the uh, classified staff that are under the 0.75 that are under that 30 hours a week uh, aren't investing the time energy and possibly their own resources in maintaining their own uh, you know their, their 180 hours um, you know uh, you know a certificate I mean they they haven't put in the, the time to be quite frankly um, to to make it to the point where they're a certificated staff right no, I agree. So I think I, I understand the uh, I understand the desire to say we need to be equitable among staff that are under a certain hour, but I don't see this as equitable uh, because these folks have put in the time to be a different class of employee. That's why they are a certificated staff versus a classified staff. So I think with my my feeling on this is I agree with the having it equitable. One, from a management standpoint, that makes it difficult. Um, however, um, I don't agree with how the timing that this has been brought to us. Um, we talked about it before when it came to us. They were notified prior to contracts, but we hadn't done anything with it. Um, my suggestion would be that we, uh, that we do follow the policy that we implemented and have it be consistent that anyone under 0.75 does not earn the general leave. However, I feel for these employees that doing that right now is not appropriate or fair. And I think that um, my suggestion would be is that we wait until the 16-17 school year. These teachers sign their contracts um, with the understanding of what they were going to be getting and we had not made a decision and so it would be a change for them with school what little 10 days away <laughs> a little over 10 days 12 days away um, I don't think it's appropriate that we implement it for this year so my suggestion would be um, and I know uh, Miss Good said that we do review this each year um, so I don't it, maybe you can help me with my suggestion I don't know if we deny it at this point um, and we review it again next year or do we approve it simply with not implementing for 15 16 that it would be implemented 16 17 why don't if, if, if I may before before Linda good chimes in it, it, because we don't know what the future holds and because you know we could be two of us could be on our way three of us could be on our way to an ASBA conference and get hit by a bus right rather than approving something to be effective that far in advance why don't we simply table it for discussion until the, the first meeting in January oh and that's what I'm asking what her suggestion Move to the 0.75 full-time equivalent for classified employees who earn 
I would agree, if I may. I do believe that the policy says you need to do it yearly, so we have not established it yet for the 15-16 school year. So I do think that a decision has to be made about the 15-16 school year, whatever that is. And then for next year, our hope is to really get contracts out way, way sooner than we did this year. So like before spring break, that would be about March 4th is when we would issue contracts. And so we would bring that to you very early, like in January or February, so you could make the decision at that point for the 16-17 school year prior to contracts being issued. And I don't know what the other board members feel on that. That would just be my suggestion is that we keep it as it is for this year. Um, that's what I know that they were notified, but I, I feel that's what they were expecting, and I think that it kind of took them by surprise because it should have been implemented the year before, and then they were continuing to accrue it. It was kind of our mistake um, that it didn't happen prior to then. So I don't know. What is the motion on the floor? The motion is as it as reads. stated. Mm -hmm. So are you asking to amend the motion? Well, that's what I was asking, Ms. Good. Do we amend the motion, or do, or do we just? Vice President Reese. Yes, Mr. I would, I would Hoffman. Like, oh, sorry, you're here now. Sorry, <laughs> President Whitener. Uh, yes, Mr. Hoffman. I would like to offer a friendly amendment to Vice President Reese's motion uh, to, oh, Mr. Wachovich's motion, sorry, uh, to simply table this until uh, the, the first meeting in January. Or at a, actually at a time when, when the Human Resources Director uh, sees it appropriate. But a decision still has to be made on the contract this year. So um, if you would like to withdraw the motion, then you can make a new motion. I'll withdraw the motion. Did someone second that? Yeah, I did. Do I have a, do we need so a you need to, you need a new, you need a new motion. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, President Weiner. Mr. Little. So I just need a little more clarification. Um, so classified staff under 0.75 receive no uh, leave benefit? That's correct, Mr. Little. Do any part-time employee receive leave benefit? Non-classified or certified? They have to be 30 hours a week in order to earn the benefit. All fringe benefits be benefit eligible for medical coverage as well as leave. Um, has it ever been entertained so full-time staff receive a uh, leave benefits depending on years of service, right? Has, there, has it been looked at to say part-time staff can receive a smaller portion of leave benefit accrues slower, fewer hours? As long as it's a minimum of 30 hours a leave, then 30 hours a week, then it is prorated based on the FTE. So if you're a 0.8125 FTE, then you're earning 0.8125, the equivalent of that of general leave. I understand that. What I'm saying is a, a part-time employee has a different leave schedule. So there, so a 0.7 employee is not earning 0.7 of a full-time FTE leave. Anybody under 0.75, it's a completely different leave schedule. No. Right. Currently, with the classified staff, they're not they're not no. earning any leave. If they are absent from work, they they are not paid that day because they don't have leave to take to get the pay. Um, I, I appreciate the history, Vice President Reese, about um, you know so a certain group kind of got loopholed a little bit. Um, in, in you know, it's, it's 0.75 is pretty reasonable. Most organizations do 0.8 as the cutoff. I think the uh, President Whitener. Mr. Hoffman. Uh, 
Board Member Little, I think the issue here is it, it, at least so. So, from what I understand, Vice President Reese has made the the argument that we didn't give, uh, we didn't make this change prior to contracts going out and being signed, right? And then my argument is that uh, these are categorically a different type of employee because they are a certified staff rather than just a you can hire anyone for this position. They have certain prerequisites, uh, training, education that they are required to get and minimum standards for uh, continuing education. And so while I understand and, and agree that in most cases and in most organizations uh, you would be able to, to make an equitable comparison there, in this I don't see them as being equal. So just to kind of recap the discussion. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just going to make a suggestion. If the board would like to see further information about classified or part-time, that can for surely come about, and that's something we can look at this year, um, that if we um, go ahead and, le and honor the original contract for this year, and then if the board so wants to know more information about the different classifications, or if we want to, you know, Maybe if they're a 0.75, maybe they earn a, a proportionate or a disproportionate amount, meaning something. Maybe they earn one out of four days compared to a full time or something. I think those conversations can take place, but I don't think that can happen right now. Agreed. Um, so, President Whitener, can I get one point of clarification from Sheila real quick? Do you know? Just a second. Okay. So, um, I was just going to suggest if you leave the contract the way it is for the next school year, and um, well, not not the way it is. Meaning, let them have their um, their leave time, and then we switch to the new one next year. Yes, Miss Good. President Weiner. Mr. Little. Um, would it be possible to amend um, this motion to approve the policy, but then add um, honoring existing contracts so that if there's changes in employment, then a new person coming in would be at the policy? Two. Mr. Hoffman. Just two quick points of clarification, Sheila. Uh, one, this is talking about fringe benefits, not just the leave. Correct. This is Correct. talking about medical. This is all of that. Correct. Okay. And then two, um, this w we are not. The policy is already in place, and so what we are doing is now in that policy. It says that we shall establish a minimum criteria, and so this is us establishing a minimum criteria. And so based on what I'm hearing from the board, um, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion. If it doesn't get a second, it doesn't get a second. But I move that uh, we establish. The minimum standard of eligibility for fringe benefits for the 2015-16 fiscal year as 0.75 FTE for all district employees, or actually for support staff. Would that be the correct way to make that, to leave certified staff as is? Linda? Um, no. So GCBD professional staff fringe benefits, that's the policy for your certified staff. Okay. And then GDBD is for your classified staff. Correct. And so what I'm doing, the policies though are already in place. So we right now are establishing the minimum criteria. And so I am establishing the minimum criteria as uh, the uh, 0.75 for classified staff and leaving it as is, as currently in application for certified staff. Got it. Does that make sense? Yep. Th that me that essentially continues with status yes, quo does. that we have right now yes, it does. until we bring this forward again. Yes, it does. Okay. And I'll second that. Any other comments or discussion? So it's just staying the way it is for the 2015-16 school year. What's that? No, I'm just I'm just making sure everyone's clear. 
<laughs> That's the motion on the table is that essentially it will stay the same. So, yes, Sheila, yep. President Whitener, Mr. Hoffman, one final point of clarification, Sheila. That means that essentially the the eight employees who would have been affected will simply not be affected until we have this conversation again. Correct. Okay. So, if a board member would like to address this again, make sure you put it on future agenda items. President Weiner, we'll, we will purposefully bring it back in the early part of the year prior to contracts this year. Okay, thank you. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Abstain? Did Mr. Rotovich vote? Yes, I we did. Got it Sorry. 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 I turn my mic on. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Okay, 9.3, um, we have information items due to code of conduct. Dr. Thompson, did we want uh, to go through the presentation or if board members just wanted to ask questions about it, any changes, any updates? We do have a, have a few updates. Dr. Nance has those updates. It's just the information item on the student code of conduct for the 15-16 school year. President Weiner, I'm actually standing in for Dr. Monroe, who worked with the committee to put this together and, and ended up under my name tonight. So bear with me. Uh, the changes to the code of conduct are very minimal. You will find them in red, the items in red. Most of those items are just clarif clarifying statements that uh, Ms. Good worked with Dr. Monroe and his committee on. The one section that has a few more changes is the rewrite of the technology acceptable use policy and it is much more comprehensive than it was before and really solves a number of issues that have come up since um, technology has been more prevalent in our schools. But other than that section, just some very few clarifying language pieces in there. There are absolutely no changes to the, the um, consequence matrix or um, the actions that are taken in terms of student discipline. So uh, those are what I understand to be the changes, very minimal from what we had in our code of conduct for last year. Uh, after tonight, this code of conduct will be uh, cleaned up and put on the website for all parents so that we have it ready for the first week of school. We'll also have copies available for anybody that wants a copy at our schools as well. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. President Weidner. Dr. Nance, when you say cleaned up. Um, what cleaned up means change the red to black, basically. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, we do have, I think there's a, a missing assistant principal name in the front, those kinds of things, but okay. um, basically make it all black print. Okay. Um, President Weidner, one more. Since this doesn't have to be approved by the board, when, as you're doing the cleanup, um, if you could just bring Linda into that. Linda, just to the same effect that we discussed prior to the meeting, um, with, since it does have the, the, tech, uh, the use of technology or, uh, I'm sorry, technology acceptable use policy, which is uh, heavily revised, um, if you could just make sure that we're tight on that so that there's no ambiguousness uh, about whether we're talking about district or non-district. Okay, thanks. Dr. Nance, and I do have a, a question regarding technology. And if I've missed it, let me know. Do we have established um, consequences for misuse of technology. Uh, where are they in here? The consequences themselves? Yeah. Hey. Hey, Paige, is that Sheila? Does anyone know? It's, it? in the mat it's in the matrix, and I apologize, there's not a. No, that's fine. Um, Oh, well, they're in alphabetical order. It's under T for technology. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
President Whitener, we do have okay, um, I, okay. technology misuse in the discipline, discipline matrix broken up for okay. the different grade levels, K2, 3, 6, and 7, 12. I see it. In, um, I, I see it. What I was, um, because that technology piece is new. Um, well, the, the technology piece is Well, no, new. That, all that in red. Maybe we could just say on there, please see, you know, matrix for technology consequences or issues or things like that. Because you have like bus interactions oh, I, and then I you have consequences and in then the you text, have. In the text of the, tech, of the acceptable use policy. I yeah. understand. Okay. And maybe just an asterisk because it's, because maybe that is new. Um, I know we have some just varying consequence issues with, with technology and, um, it's, and I just, it's, um, with special ed. Um, when it comes to technology and how that might differ. And I don't know if it does or not, but I think that's something we need to make sure there's clear um, consequences. And I don't, I don't know how the special ed situations fall under this. Um, but just because all that red is new under technology, that there's an asterisk, you can say we can do that. matrix. Yeah. All right, thanks. That, that's what I was looking for. All right, thank you very much. Nine point four is a second read policy J I C K student violence harassment intimidation bullying. President Whitener. Mr. Hoffman. I will make a motion that we approve the amendments to policy J I C K and regulation J I C K dash R student violence slash harassment slash intimidation slash bullying. Sorry, did you move the did you move the regulation too? Mm-hmm. Sorry, I was That's right. I was reading, so I didn't hear that. Second. Is there any questions or comments? Um, we brought this. We didn't approve it on a first read, so I don't remember if someone had a question or discussion for that. You and I had just said we wanted more time to dig into it. So, and President Weiner, Linda just. To clarify, I know it's in our information, but just to clarify, these are changes primarily driven by uh, uh, changes in FERPA, right? The the privacy. Okay. I've, I've really been, it's not a substantive change. It's really more keeping up with the law. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. 9.5. President Whitener. Mr. Hoffman. I move that we adopt a resolution to assign court ordered garnishment processing to Maricopa County Education Service Agency for 2015 2016. Second. Any comments or questions? Maybe this is a question for Ms. Deuce. Is this, um, I know we hadn't always done this in the past, but is it is it working out for us? Is it is it efficient and maybe Someone else has the history on it, but um, are they the best agency to, to use at this point, or the only one to use? Actually, I'm going to refer this to Sheila. <laughs> President Whitener, members of the board, they're the only agency. <laughs> okay. Okay. President Whitener, quick question, Sheila. Is this something, if, if they truly are the only one, is this something that we could throw on the, the sole source list uh, in future years? I'm going to defer that one to Linda.
I was more just curious on if that would be an appropriate place. So uh, for clarification, uh, you know, this is, uh, is essentially uh, dealing in entirety with wage garnishments. And so as such, I mean, couldn't uh, a collections attorney, I mean, aren't there other options for this? Uh, you know, because I, I know collections attorneys do garnishments and things like that. So is this the only option I just, because I assume we pay a fee for this. The employee pays fifty dollars. Okay. 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 Got it. Got it. Sure. I understand. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Any all in favor? Aye. 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 9.6. I move that the governing board appoints the director of finance as the student activities treasurer and that the business manager is appointed as the assistant student activities treasurer. I'll second. Support. Can I ask who has the title as the business manager right now? Isabel Colas. Say it again. Isabel Colas. Thank you. Any questions or discussion after my question? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. 9.7, the board has um, an opportunity to put a pro statement or we need to put a pro statement in favor of the 15% MNO override to appear in the informational packet and submit it to Maricopa County Elections Department. I'm not sure if any other board members submitted edits or suggestions. But the one before us, if there is um, any grammar or editing, I would hope district office could go over some of that or any questions or suggestions? Can we, can we see this up on the screen? So I can, it's right. You mean up there? Yeah, fine. I'm just, I had my glasses for me, sorry. Oh, um, IT, JJ, can you put this statement on the screen? Should. Dr. Thomason, does on our screens up here? Okay? Mr. Wotovich, you want it on the computer screen? Please. Just okay. Or. Okay, that's what I'm going to see. Okay, let me just see. President Weiner. Mr. Little. Or winning, I'll just add some comment. Um, it looks good to me. I do like the bullet point order and wording that we discussed at the um, uh, work study. Looks like that turned out as planned. So thank you for those changes. And I'm not sure at the word count if we need to. Um, did we in the pamphlet put art, music, physical education? In the ballot language, did we just put specials or did we list art, music, physical education? We, we listed art, music, and physical education. Okay. We, we listed those areas. We don't want anything listed here that's not in the ballot language. President Wittner. Mr. Wittowicz. I just, um, just a question. I referenced the uh, section that says, uh, uh, the second bullet says maintain, improve elementary specials. We didn't list library. Is there a reason for that? Or? Well, that's why I just asked if we put, if that was in the ballot language, did we put library in the ballot language? 
I don't believe we had the librarians specifically in the ballot language. Um, we, we copied this out of the, the ballot language or out of the um, resolution. Yeah, I think so. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Reese was stating if we had used the word such as when we talked about specials. But um, what does such as mean? You can just mean as examples. Right. Yeah, I think we used the word such as. So. Yeah. Okay, so if we can... Um, I don't know. If we can include such as, I'm not sure what this word count is. Okay. I will take a look at that and I will get, uh, get back with you tomorrow on the addition of such as and the word count. Does this need, this needs to be approved tonight though, correct? That is yes. correct, but it can be approved uh, with the amendments that you would like to make. So we're going to put library in there? Can it be special? Well, Miss. Speak into your mics, please. Okay. If we're going to use the word such as, yeah. then we'll put such as, which would imply library, if you will. Okay. I just think that's important because we had a reduction. We had a reduction in the library staff, and to improve our district, I think that's very important to uh, show that in there. President Whitener, if we can, someone, if we go back to the minutes, are they recorded in last meeting's minutes? Would anyone mind scrolling? I'll, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a sec. So have to go back 118 pages. President Weiner, Mr. Little. the minutes don't state the actual wording of the document that we looked at in the work study. Did you find it? Yeah. yeah. Page three. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so it does. Bottom of the paragraph, page uh, three in the minutes. So, Dr. Thompson, if we can just make sure that is mirrored. We will. We will um, make sure to add such as to the bullet, the third bullet. Thank you. Can I make one more other suggestion? Mr. Rotovich. Um, we hear that last statement, Higley's expectations are more than just basic. What are, your, what are your thoughts on our children's educational future depends upon you? I don't, how do you feel about that last sentence? I just think that Higley's expectations are more than just basic, seems a little bit. Does that cross into electioneering? Yeah. Say it again. Does that cross into electioneering? Does what, Mr. Rotova just suggested? Yeah, if, if, because that's more of a call to action. Well, we're asking them to support it. Actually, we're not. We're saying the board supports it. This this appears to be fairly factual. And asks for your support. Oh, yeah, okay. Good call. I mean, the... That's okay. That's a pro statement. Well, it's a pro statement. Okay. We don't have a con statement, but this right. is the place where you can support Fair enough. Any other thoughts or questions? I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not opposed to it. I'm here for discussion. Um, sometimes I think some things sound kind of cliche. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so if there's a different way, that's a more of a, a call to action. Well, I see, okay, what was it? Sometimes? I put our children's educational future depends upon it. So removing Higley's expectations are more than basic? Because I just think that just sounds or like Or Higley's expectations are much higher? Are, are just... It sounds aloof. Well, in that time, I'm not saying the exact semantics of it, but, <laughs> you know, in a way to convey that. Yeah. Um, mm. Any other board members, any district staff have any suggestions? Well, maybe continuing the sentence there, the board supports a yes vote November 3rd and asks for your support. To maintain high... To maintain Higley's high expectations. expectations. Perfect. Okay. Say it again. <laughs> the board supports a yes vote November 3rd, 2015, and asks for your support. Uh, it, support of Higley, or something like that. Of Higley maintaining their high expectations or. Maintaining Higley's high standards. Higley's high standards. This must be of or ask for your support in maintaining. Higley's. Yeah, I'm totally confused now. High academic standards? High expectations, high standards. Maybe high expectations or standards. It's not just academics. That's true. We're all about the whole child. Standards, expectations. <laughs> Spartan strong. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag as part. Yeah, sure. That sounds great. <laughs> oh, that's funny. We should throw in a hashtag Spartan Strong just for Nancy. Hashtag Higley Strong. Yeah. <laughs> we we can do whatever we want. We can put, I mean, www. You know, husd. org. Check out all finance. As long as we stay within the word limit. <laughs> You know, and sometimes there is an opportunity there to direct people to information. You know, if you think, you know, if we're talking about finances there, you can visit www.hgsd.org for all financial information. So there's an opportunity there. But, um, you know, five board members trying to decide on. It's okay what you do. Support a more enriched education. Do what? Ask for your support of a more enriched education. Is that too vague? <laughs> yes. No, I'm <laughs> Higley's kids deserve more. Just put it in quite an exclamation point. Higley's kids rock. <laughs> Stia, what did you say? Excellence. Com commitment to excellence, is that what you said? Isn't that Gilbert's slogan? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and that's, I mean, I mean, really, that's, that's what we're all about, you know? And so, you know, we do these pro statements and you, you try an opportunity to, to get people to pay attention or give them, you know, a little bit more about, about Higley. Um, you know, I do like that we're always about continuous improvement, you know? E yeah, we could be the number one district in the state, but is everyone happy? No. <laughs> do we have more and better things to do? Um, yes. Um, so to relay, um, ask for your support in continuing Higley's, you know, commitment to increase excellence. What did you just say? <laughs> Ask for your support in maintaining Higley's commitment. Did you say maintaining or continuing? Or continuing Higley's commitment to... I was going to say education at that point. You know, it's that continuous improvement part that that's... I love it. Getting everybody yeah. chiming in. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> He's back 
there Googling words. (laughs) (laughs) Thesaurus.com. Well, what's what's the whole sentence? (laughs) In maintaining or continuing our... Our achievements. It's not bad. We ask for support in continuing Higley's... I like achievements. Good. I like that. Remember that. Oh. Because <laughs> we hear it and then we ask you to repeat I've heard it. that before. Like, I heard it. Now let me. That, that, that sounds good. So that does work nicely. Say that, Mr. Riss, Mr. Little. Ask for your support in. Um, Higley, how'd that go? Yeah. And so you could just make it shorter. Ask for your support in Higley's exceptional learning experience. And providing, yeah. Higley's exceptional learning experience. Okay. I'm good with that. Any thoughts back there? President Whitener. Mr. Hawking. I'd like to commend this room on exceptional collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do. I don't know. Thank you. Okay. So to Sorry, Miss Olivas. <laughs> to, to, to clarify what we have. <laughs> okay, so Mr. Little and I should know your first name. Balsh. Balsh. I said Balk. I know. Um, so it's Mr. Little and asks for your support in providing exceptional learning experiences. learning experiences mm-hmm. Continuing the exceptional so learning read, experience. Ask for your support in continuing Higley's or our exceptional learning experiences. Yes. I mean, the reality is, is we're just trying to maintain what we have. <laughs> okay. I am okay with um, continuing. Any further discussion? Do we have that down, Ms. Olivas? <laughs> so to summarize, President Whitener, I have uh, the statement changed to in continuing exceptional learning experiences and the addition of such as in bullet two. Was it in continuing our or in continuing Higley's? I like it in continuing Higley's exceptional learning experiences. I have just a couple more. A couple okay. more? A couple more. One um, third bullet down, it says higher teachers. I'd like that to say higher quality. Uh, higher as quality. long as it's within word limit. Okay, higher quality staff to reduce average class size if, if it's within the word count. And I'm just going to continue on so then we can just have the word count. Um, in the second paragraph at the beginning, I've got listed, it says, after years of difficult re- budget reductions, if word counts possible, after years and millions of dollars of difficult budget uh, re- reductions, all during and then growing demand for a quality Higley education. And then in the third paragraph, Higley is uh, fiscally responsible, audited low administrative costs. So it shows that we're being, you know, reference to that. So if there are, if the word count, (laughs) 
I just think it's important for the community to understand that we've done millions of dollars. When somebody just says difficult, oh, okay, but no, when you say millions of dollars, and this is all during, you know, this, this certain period of time, and the point, and the other point in the third paragraph, it says audited. So it shows that, you know, in reference to, you know, the cost for being cost effective on this at the same time. I don't have a problem with those. Is there a way that we can put this into a word count? I don't have that ability at this time, but I can definitely get it done tonight. We're, we're past the word count. Yeah. No, I but I mean, that can happen. Well, j j you missed a, you missed the last line. Thank you. Okay, so if you include such as, oh, no, sorry, but up by the elementary specials, so the second Whitener. bullet, the second bullet, such as, okay, so that's 198, that's the limit. 200, oh, yeah, we're there. and we change it to, and asks for your support in continuing Higley's exceptional, exceptional learning experiences. Learning experiences. Ask for your support in continuing Higley's exceptional learning experiences. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are at 197. So, Mr. Rotovich, if you would like to add the word audited. Higley is fiscally responsible. Um, I don't know how you, if you just put audited, low administrative costs, is that a proper grammar? There's no it, comma after audited. Could it be Higley is fiscally responsible and audited? And has. Oh, too many words. Higley's fiscal. So you would have room still for after years of. Yeah. Higley's audited fiscal response. Or Higley's audited. Well, I think when you put azed.gov, it takes you to the website of audits. So I think maybe that's implied. Say that again. I just said if they know how to find ours, because the azed.gov is going to take them to the main website, and they're going to have to search for audits. Well, you go to the website, and it says put in your district. I know, but. Mr. Rotovich, what's your decision on audited? <laughs> me. Uh, audited? Yes. How did you want that? Say that again. Higley is physically responsible, semicolon, audited low administrative costs. Okay, so just as briefly. Yeah. Okay. So with, it's okay if you don't want it, that's fine. <laughs> with two words left, you would be able to put after years and millions of, and millions would it fit in there. After years and millions of difficult budget, budget reductions. No, it was after years and millions of dollars of difficult budget oh. reductions, all during a growing demand. You've got well, two more. We've got, we've got two words. But the, the, the I, we could go on for hours. Okay, I just. Yeah, 
what's the word? Did we, um, in that third bullet on the bottom, did we list higher quality staff or are you going to list it as, as um, higher teachers? About higher quality staff because in addition to just teachers, we would hire additional staff, correct? Well, do you want to move and millions? Oh, we're up there, sorry. We're I'm just at trying two, to negotiate we're the at numbers. 200. We're at 200. How many do we have to have? 200 is all we can have. Okay. <laughs> so if, um, you know, if there's a better way to say Higley graduates received 22 million plus in scholarships each of the last two years, um, if there's a way to say two years in a row. Yeah. Higley graduates received 22 million plus in scholarships. Do we even need to specify each of the last two years? Two years running, got another word. Say that again? <laughs> two years running, got another word there. Would we even say two million dollars? Would you say each of the last two years? Running. How about you could do two years in a row, and then Mr. Rotovich, we could put in higher quality teachers and staff. Um. I'm seeing no. What? <laughs> <laughs> Higher quality. Mr. Rotovich, do we have do we have staff in the ballot language? Page 26. We we can't add to the bullets if okay. it's if it's changing the ballot language. That's fine. Just leave it time. Um, in the minutes, it says provide staffing to reduce average class sizes. Provide staffing. Provide staffing? Mm-hmm. You reduce high teachers and staff. Okay, what is our word count right now? Oh. It's two. Okay, so do we want to put two years in a row and then put higher teachers and staff? Well, I think Mr. Little said the bullet reads provide staff. Provide staffing to reduce. So maybe we should just change that. Bullet one, or sorry, bullet three, put provide staffing. Provide staffing to reduce average class size. Provide staffing. It's, it's the same word count. So do you still want to make the change 22 million plus in scholarships two years running? I'd put two years in a row. Two years in a row. Previous two years? Say that again. <laughs> two years running, it just seems. How about previous two years? Running just seems so just very casual. Thank you. So running is very casual. <laughs> two years consecutively. Two consecutive years. Two consecutive years. Previous years. Two years. I've got some English majors out there. <laughs> Mr. Cover, would you mind helping whisper that through the door? <laughs>
That's okay. This is as all duties prescribed. We need to delete some words. Didn't save anything. It just says to say four two consecutive years. I think you would just say in scholarships for two consecutive years. So put four, F-O-R. In scholarships for, F-O-R, for two consecutive years. So now you could add millions of dollars, so d d of dollars after millions. Do we, do hey, we're despair. No, we're there. <laughs> do we need to say two two years from this? I think the point was it was twenty two million plus. The last two consecutive each years. consecutive year. So I don't know. You could put forty-four million dollars and be done with it, right? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or let's just, or just leave audited out and just say low administrative costs and just leave it alone. Fine, keep it simple. While we have the group of English helpers in the back, I do just have one question on um, in the last sentence in the third paragraph, the last sentence it says to provide all students with this, it says highest, should we just say high? This, with, this, with this high degree of success? The? With? This should be the? put the with the highest degree of success okay I'm done take a fork in it we're at 199 we can put hashtag Higley strong that's all one word <laughs> Mr. Hoffman in his mic is saying, do it. <laughs> we can do it. That's um, as long as there's no one. Uh... <sighs> Mr. Zucker. Good suggestion, Royal Words. Mr. Little, what's up? I said good suggestion, Royal Words. We're out of room for words. Does after years and millions of dollars of difficult budget reductions, does that work?
All right, members of the board. Unless someone wants to change something else. <laughs> to lead to an ultimate change in the last sentence. Now, Dr. Thomason, in how this is submitted, it will hopefully, the format will be um, reformatted <laughs> in how it looked Absolutely. originally. Absolutely, the, the um, county will make us put it in the, the correct format before we turn it in. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Abstain? President Whitener, let the minutes reflect that I abstained because I did not support putting the override on the ballot in the first place. Who second the motion? I did. Mr. Watovich. Thank you. All right, thank you for bearing with us on that. 9.8, we have a motion to, to approve. Boots President Whitener, contract. members of the board, I do have uh, Southwest Food Services here tonight to do a presentation and able to answer any of your questions on the board agenda item of 9.8. So if it pleases the board, I would like to have them come up and, and present to the board. Okay. Thank you. that you may have. Uh, so first, I want to introduce who I have with me here tonight. Um, I have um, Stephanie Lucas. She's our Director of Regional Operations. I have Dan Matello, SFE President, and Rachel Lindstrom, our Director of Compliance. So they'll be talking to certain parts of, with you tonight. Um, so first, I want to do a little recap of the year that we've had. And uh, several of you were here at the beginning of the year, but we have some new members, so just to kind of provide an overview of uh, us coming on board. So we were awarded the contract on Thursday prior to the school opening uh, on Monday morning. So within that, those four days, we came on, um, got all the food ordered, supplies, uniforms for staff. We uh, transitioned the current staff over, and, and we did all the training with them within those couple days. So we flew in um, 20 SFE support personnel uh, to be on site to assist with that opening and to uh, have breakfast ready to go Monday morning. So some things that we're uh, proud of that we accomplished over the year. So firstly, we uh, provide high quality, diverse, delicious menus. Uh, our number one priority is providing excellence and how we do that is uh, high quality food and high quality service. The way that we do that is by providing hands-on training for our staff. So we have uh, monthly training meetings, but in addition to that, we're on site in the schools every single day to provide direction and support to our teams. We provide 100% USDA compliant menus. Uh, we also participate in nutrition education for our students, parents, teachers, and community. When I was here uh, back in the winter and talking with you guys, we. Uh, we had shared with you that we participated in Parent University at Gateway Point this year. So in addition to donating breakfast and snacks for that event, I also uh, taught a class on healthy eating habits for, for students. And so um, a classroom with parents and got them involved and provided that education for them. Another event that we had done when I had spoken with you guys last year, or last winter, um, was our Thanksgiving meal event. So we put on uh, a very large, uh, meal for 
our students, but then also invited family, parents to come eat with us. And so we had uh, double the turnout than what we normally would on Thanksgiving at many of our schools, and it was a great success. Uh, lots of great reviews on, on our meal that day. So some things that we've done since then, since we've uh, been with you, is DJ Cheetah. So in the picture here, you'll see our mascot that was out. Um, this picture was taken at Power Ranch. So DJ Cheetah goes around and gets students excited about uh, healthy fruits and vegetables and exercise, and uh, it's a really fun event for students. We did some taste testings on new products. We catered the Arizona Special Olympics event that we hosted out here. So Friday night we served all of the athletes dinner, and then Saturday morning we uh, served, or Saturday afternoon we served lunch. So each day was about a, a thousand meals served between four sites. Uh, this year we also participated in National School Lunch Hero Day. So what that is is it's a day to uh, have students recognize and thank our kitchen staff for all that they do for them. So this was a really exciting event. The students made cards and drew pictures and really got involved in thanking our staff for what they do. So our, our staff were very appreciative of that and our kids really like to have the opportunity to thank them as well. And we do Lucky Tray Days. So we like to have one about every month. And then we also did some of the caterings for award ceremonies um, for various programs at the end of the year. Um, so with that quick recap of the year, now I'm going to hand over to Dan, who will talk to some of the financials. Uh, what, I, what you have in front of you here is a, is a brief overview, and this basically starts from the year we just ended. And basically, it lays out what the projected return was for the year, 513658 and then what it does is it basically walks you through to what the return is going to be for this year. And this was the first run, so the projected return for this year is 400000 This was the first uh, uh, budgeted amount and first budget that we presented. So the return is a little different than what's up to full passive return. But some of the contributing factors on how you went from 538 to the three to the 400000 I kind of want to walk through this. And, and the big factor, a couple big factors that, that really played a part on how you went from 513 down to that 400,000. The biggest one being, and, and again, I think we're all seeing this on the news, is the food costs. You know, there's going to be a number of things that happen. There's a major drought in California, which is going to affect us from a, from a produce standpoint. Um, the other big factor that's happening is the avian flu is really going to affect the chicken and turkey crop this year. And the other big one is the beef. And beef on two boats, two sides. They're slaughtering a bunch of cattle, which which is going to be a problem. But in that, in, and also by doing that, it's going to reduce the number of dairy cows out there. So we're going to see it on the beef side, and we're going to see it on the dairy side. So our our vendors are telling us to plan for about a nine percent increase in overall food cost dollars that are going to be spent going into the next school year. So that's that's a big part of where. That reduction is coming. That equates to right under 100,000, 98, 8, 8, 10. And then the other big contributing factor that we propose in the budget is an increase for the overall staff, which averages about a 2% increase, which equates to about an $18,000 increase that the staff would re receive for, for the next school year. Now, again, that is proposed. And, and again, we typically partner with the, with the school districts we do business with, and if that's something that we want to consider or take off the board, that's that's open for discussion. But we did propose it and build it into the budget for this next school year. And then the last big thing is, as we all know, the law changed this last year. And to become ACA compliant, there was some additional uh, benefits costs that came along as well. So that's really where you started at the 513 and how we got to the 400000 for the upcoming school year. So with that being said, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to Stephanie, and she has a couple things she's going to touch on. And Go from there. Okay. So, forging ahead, I want to make sure that we're looking at where we're going for this next upcoming school year. And we have a few areas that I feel we're really experts in, and I wanted to walk us through some of those. So the first is our culinary expertise. Some plans we have for the upcoming year are to implement roving chefs. Roving Chef is an opportunity for us to do some hands-on cooking training with students. It's active, they're engaged in the program. Um, we can actually do it during the school day or we can do it during the lunch service as well. Um, in addition to that, we plan on rolling out some new concepts. These are restaurant style concepts. So think food truck and think what you're see going on um, when you're, you're out shopping. The first one I'd like to talk about is Dog House. Dog House is our hot dog line. 
So uh, this would be uh, made to order hot dogs. My favorite happens to be the Chicago dog, uh, but the students could actually walk up and pick what toppings they would like on that hot dog. Uh, the next one is blended. Blended is our smoothie line. Uh, the beauty of this is it's a reimbursable meal in a cup. It it's all compliant, all in one. So uh, it has the fiber requirements, the grain requirements, the, the fruit requirements are all in there. And this can be served as an a la carte item and sold, or it can be used as a reimbursable meal. In addition to that, we'd like to run Stax. Stax is a gourmet hot uh, hamburger line. So similar to our doghouse, they can build their own. And Yaya's is a Mediterranean line. So think hummus, think tzatziki sauce. We're seeing a lot of this out in the field right now, and we want to be able to incorporate this into our schools. So how we would roll this out is by doing student surveys, by giving them samples and letting them tell us what are the products that they're most interested in, and then we know what to menu in the future. The next area is our uh, nutritional expertise. So we already talked about uh, Parent University. We would still like to partner with that. In addition, we would like to roll out something called Date with a Dietitian. You are lucky enough to have a registered dietitian as your director on site. And Date with a Dietitian would be an opportunity for the community. We would open up dietitian access to all of our Higley community, students, parents, teachers, and be able to really walk parents through what does a healthy snack look like at home? How can they make some healthy meals? Um, outside of the school day to help incorporate their, their family into the wellness piece. Um, in addition to that, we'll do some wellness education, some health fairs, um, and our Get Fit program. Our Get Fit program is an opportunity for students to get exercise in the line while they're waiting to get their meal. So we'll burn some calories before we start taking in some food, and it's a lot of fun for the students to do that. Um, in addition to that, we have some promotion expertise. We will be doing some giveaways. We'll still be running some holiday events. We'll bring DJ Cheetah back, which everybody loved. And we'll have some focus groups for students so they can really tell us what parts of these promotions are they liking, what food items do they want, and, and why. Um, and last is our compliance expertise. I think this one is particularly important because you are about to go into an ADE review year. So we have our uh, director of compliance here and she's gonna talk a little more about that, but we will be providing on-site audit training and staff training. Um, so I really believe we, we can get through the audit, we can get through the audit well and, uh, and make Higley shine. So with that being said, I'll hand it over to Rachel. Um, as Stephanie did mention, In addition to compliance, sorry, <laughs> so loud. Um, SFE does offer not only compliance, but a culinary piece and nutrition as well as Stephanie and Rachel have kind of mentioned on. Um, smart snacks and fundraising does seem to be a very hot topic this upcoming school year, specifically in Arizona. ADE released a memo very recently regarding um, school districts to be able to now purchase, purchase, submit a waiver to ADE to sell non-compliant items. Um, one of the notes that they do mention in that memo is that although school districts can submit for a waiver, they, these items cannot be sold during service times, meaning breakfast and lunch service. I'd, I'd like to break a point to that about what is the impact of doing something like a fundraiser fiscally for the district. So I put these numbers up here because I really feel like it's important to express that. There's going to be an impact to Higley and there's going to be an impact to SFE. So we threw up some numbers here so that we could see what that looks like. The estimate, when, when we would run a fundraiser, uh, regardless of whether we did it during the school day and used compliant foods or, or signed a waiver, students are not going to participate at the same rate that they normally would in purchasing a reimbursable meal. So the estimated reimbursement revenue loss with one day of a, re of a fundraiser is almost $15,000. In addition to that, the meal counts that we've been promised through our contract would not be there because the, the participation is not gonna be there. And so it would be a $12,000 loss to us, which would go against the return as well. So when you combine those together for one day of uh, fundraisers, it's gonna be about a $27,000 a day loss for Higley. So we wanna make sure we look at that impact. With that being said, uh, we're welcome to questions if there are any. I would just like to say in reference to the uh, Thanksgiving dinner, um, I've heard from a number of families at Coronado, I see the principal out there, you did an outstanding job, a huge turnout you had at that school and I heard nothing but compliments. So I wanna thank you for working with the community over at that school. Okay, so a couple questions. When you're saying fundraiser, you're saying if 
if a club decided, if students decided to sell something for a fundraiser, that is a $27,000 loss for one day. You said it was times of service, so what if they're not selling it during lunch? What if it's before school or after school? What if it's... Do, So if someone wants to buy a candy bar, how does that affect your lunch service be, or our lunch service? Be, well, I, yeah, the, they're making a choice between buying a reimbursable meal or participating in the in the fundraiser. They don't have to make that choice, but typically that's what we see happen. And in a district like Higley that is low, free, and reduced, we're at about 25%, give or take, of free and reduced, that means about 75% of your student potty came with cash in their pocket. They're planning on spending it and they're not worried about the government reimbursable meal. So what we see in other districts is when this happens, they participate in the fundraiser. They don't participate in meal service. So we've brought all of our staff on site, all labor, um, all the food is prepped and ready to go and, and we're not able to sell that food because the students do not participate in the meal service on that particular day. Do we have numbers on, you know, you say cash service, I mean, I, and I think Higley is unique, and I don't know if it's been outspoken. It's not cash in hand. It's a lot of parents pack lunches. That's just Higley. It's unique. And it's not, <laughs> I, I don't know how else to say it and why we're not, we're not talking about it, is it's not they're having cash on hand. It's what is our student population, are we looking at these numbers, is what is our student population compared to how many are um, in our system, you know, to buy the meals, the preloaded system, or, um, you know, how we can actually keep track or get some sort of numbers. Um, it's, this community packs lunches, okay? So what I don't understand, and, and this might not be something to do with this company, or your positions and, and job is, as a district is, we have to be compliant and we can't do fundraising and selling candy bars, but why do we have all of those horrible foods coming in for birthdays? I, I don't get it. How is that not conflicting with what your jobs are? And so that's what I don't get is, now we have a waiver that we can sell things differently, but yet we're still bringing in all this crud, pardon my language, just junk, for birthdays and parties. So that's not affecting you. Do you know what I'm saying? So how can, why not sell a candy bar in the morning or coffee for the special ed club to make money? Or maybe you could provide the coffee at cost and then they could sell it. Is that doable? I mean, I don't. The biggest thing I would say is any effect that it would have on the overall guarantee that we have, if the numbers were lower, participation would, would, would be lower, which looking at many of our partners that we currently partner with, there is a drop off. Due to that drop off, we would come back and off, we would ask for relief because that's just the way it is. But typically our numbers will drop off. They will choose between the items that you're selling and the items we're selling. I can't compete with coffee and muffins and donuts. Only for and those the teachers, not things. coffee for the kids. Yeah. <laughs> right. so, you'd be surprised. Oh, okay. <laughs> coffee for the teachers. Um, um, but quickly, to clarify, when you say ask for relief, you're asking for an actual dollar-to-dollar -dollar relief, not this $27,000 relief. I would come back and whatever the lower the revenue was lowered by or the meal participation would, lower, would be lowered by, we would come back, put a dollar amount to it, and take it off the bottom. Lowered based on what? Based on average? By, by average, exactly. And is that average taking into account last year's numbers as well, or is that does it start clean every year? We look at it based on what you're, tr you're trending and what you're doing at that particular point in time. My, po my question is, is, is it based on just this year, day one to day X, or is it from start of contract last year no, to day X? No, last year is closed out. We don't, we don't go back and look at that. And, and again, 
the numbers from last year to this year, it's probably a good thing. The numbers from last year coming out of your prior food service management company are we're, we actually trend up in certain areas where, where they don't. So I, I don't I don't see the point in going back and looking at to, those. To them, I'm talking about to your first year here. Right, yeah. our, our first year. Um, so students can sell things before and after school, correct? Yes. We were saying just not from the whole school day. During President Whitener. Mr. Thomas. Uh, one Thompson. thing we want to make sure is that anything the students sell before school and to 30 minutes after school meet the SMART stack, stack requirements provided by the federal government. So what's the waiver for that ADE has? I thought that was to allow them out of those. The, the waiver was basically set up, um, speaking on behalf of fundraisers, in mm -hmm. school districts it's very hard for booster clubs, and I love the idea that fundraisers are set in place to basically support a lot of that budget. Um, for the, like the cheer team, for the special ed, ed students, I completely support that. The waiver is set up so that if s districts do want to start utilizing this, they are allotted a certain amount of waivers and exemptions, so to speak, throughout that school year to do this. From the smart snacks yes. requirements. Yes. Um, and so that's where, for me, I'm, I'm very compliance-based, and so going into a, an administrative review year, I see a lot more misconception from district or school site to school site as opposed to district to district. Um, I know going in from site to site and through reviews, training one set of employees is completely different. And when you see one school doing it, it's hard, even though they may have gone through proper protocol to get all that stuff situated, it's so hard misconceptually wise to teach them, well, they signed a waiver, this is their one allotted fundraiser. With that being said, the fundraisers are going to be the amount of waivers that each district does submit. Um, Arizona, fortunately has allotted for quite a bit of fundraiser waivers, I'm going to call them. Um, I think Texas has allotted for six. Arizona is basically almost triple that. Um, and so what Arizona ADE is afraid of is that a lot of districts will take advantage of those allotted exemptions. And the whole reason for Smart Snacks was so that students would start eating better and purchasing those reimbursable meals for the fruits, the vegetables, and that proportion, but actually getting snacks that are somewhat nutritious and so what ADE is going to look to monitor this year is, well, I gave you this amount, and now districts are taking advantage of it. And so that's what the waiver is set there so that, yes, I understand fundraisers are, are great. We want to give you that opportunity because we all know in fundraisers, frozen cookie dough is going to go 10 times better than, let's say, a granola bar. Um, and so that's the reason behind the waivers is they understand that in districts it's very difficult from a support team, especially from a fundraising point of view, point of view to be able to support a lot of the, the changing, a lot of the new uniforms and things like that. And so that's why they've allotted these waivers. So does selling cookie dough count as one of those? Because you don't eat that at school. Um, that is, that's included in the memo. If it's not to meant to be consumed on site, cookie dough is not included. Um, I'm just a devil's advocate because I love cookie dough. And so I'm <laughs> going to eat it on site. So. <laughs> not, not every kid's like that. but Well, it doesn't go to the school. Yeah. Um, and I, I just don't know, and I just don't know enough about it. And I think, I mean, it, it's nothing to um, South. You know, it's nothing towards Southwest. It's just, we just, it's a state and federal issue that's just chaotic. Because I can't sell a granola bar, but I don't want to put a damper on anyone's birthday. But I'm just sick of the crud that comes into these classrooms, and. And may, well, is, it, is that why it's okay? Because it's free? Because parents are bringing it? No, and well, there's the wellness policy as well that districts can choose to include anything about this. So if you guys, or if the board wants to actually have that written into their wellness policy where parents can't bring in certain items, you guys can do that. Um, a lot of times it comes from USDA, then obviously since we're in Arizona ADE, but the local wellness policy that you guys actually implement comes supersedes all of that. So you can make it as strict as you want it. And, and we can provide a catering menu that can, the teacher, students, parents can use that provides healthy meals on site. So if they can't bring in the junk, we can provide healthy options um, for them to, to be able to provide to the students. That's probably not a bad idea, but I mean, we're definitely not the Gestapo here in Higley, so, yeah. Did you say Gestapo? Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> so question on the relief 
Uh, what do we need to do? What do our administrators need to know to avoid having you ask for relief on fundraisers? Do they have to do it after school so that it doesn't impact? Um, preferably, yes, after school. Um, one of the things that we did mention was also doing when health fairs occur, um, having a booth set up specifically for a fundraiser to get not only um, parents involved, but a lot more students. Um, I know speaking on behalf, if I had a friend who held a booth for, let's say, the cheer club, I'm going to bring all my other friends and help support that as well. But then you also get them in the health fair, learning a lot about things that are going on in the community from a health point, point of view as well. So the, the federal standards are crap. Uh, they're junk from my perspective and so uh, if we hold if when we use our waivers when we allow clubs to use those waivers let's please make sure that they don't impact this and we don't get a request for relief from food service mr. Hoffman I just uh, want to let you guys know that we did have a training this morning Ms. good spent four hours with our administrators this morning and this topic was one of the primary topics that was covered so as recent as today we've talked about it I guess, I guess just to re-clarify, I just don't want us to authorize any wavered fundraisers that are going to cause us to have to give money back. President Weiner. Um, just a question about, is it, is it possible for you to better anticipate demand on those days that there are fundraisers so you don't provide all that food? I can take that one. Um, it's really, really hard with fundraisers. A lot of the time, um, I relate this a lot to field trips. Um, with, when kitchens don't know in advance, a lot of waste does happen because a lot of that food is prepped. And we are firm believers on scratch cooking and cooking from scratch. And so a lot of our prep goes in the day before. Um, so on those fundraising days, I, I mean, it's, it's really hard. But a lot of it does deal a lot with the waste. And that's where I... I cringe a little because I mean there's there's so much food waste that goes on into school food and without knowing that a fundraiser is going to go on um, these waivers do need to be filled out and submitted prior prior and then before actually implementing anything AD does need to approve it okay. on uh, field trip days do you guys request relief if there's a typically um, what we request is we teach this the staff that there's advance notice um, what we like to see is there's forms and there's a lot of I you can even Google some um, they have really nice ones out there but two weeks in advance so that way we can kind of plan for it and then subtract some of our numbers from their forecasting so that we're not wasting food Fair enough obviously yep. and then well. if, if someone forgets if a school site lets one slip through the cracks do you guys ask for relief on that no, no. okay we have not no so I, I don't know exactly what fundraisers are going around the state, but I'm not, you know I, I don't see people fundraising lunches. So you know we're starting school in July. It's hot. I mean afternoon recess. Can't the student council sell a fifty cent bomb pop? I mean it doesn't. It's after lunch. The kids are going to come. I mean wouldn't they're not going to not buy lunch without the waiver that's non-compliant. Um, Smart snacks before Smart snacks was put into place, they used the term competitive food. Um, it hasn't necessarily gone away with the smart snacks rule and, rules and regulation, but they don't use the word competitive anymore. And the way that they look at it is it so an all-natural fruit juice popsicle. Pardon? An all-natural fruit juice popsicle. Oh, that's I didn't know what that was. I, when Sorry. you say bomb oh no, cake, I'm just little like Debbie type cake <laughs> things. I don't know, <laughs> like an otter pop or. Oh, I didn't know that. I've never had one of those. Um, <laughs> I'm somewhat of a selective palate. Um, so if it is Smart Snacks approved, that's something different that we can discuss. Um, there is a set list. I know we, we have a set list of Smart Snacks approved snacks that people can sell. Um, typically when dealing with a review, I like to make rounds because I know that that does happen. Um, and you casually walk around and see that they're selling something. And if it's Smart Snacks approved, there's really not much more you can say to it other than that regardless of the fact that the competitive food term has gone out, it is still competing. So it competes with reimbursement. It competes with students grabbing that fruit and vegetable tray as opposed to just going and getting a... a Even after popsicle. lunch. Yeah, I, I'm with President Whitener on this. I think that's a matter of opinion. I think 
again, the bottom line being if it doesn't impact meal sales on that day, it doesn't impact revenue, there wouldn't be a change in yeah. the estimated return. We just wanted to make sure that you, that you saw some numbers to be able to equate to, well, what does this mean? What is the bottom line? Um, if we tried it and there there wasn't an impact, then you you would we would be just as we had before. Yeah. President Whitener. I think we talked about that earlier through, or throughout the year, but I, I never. Yeah. If you know, it has to, I guess, to go through teachers that it gets to parents or. And the one thing to keep in mind, we're reasonable with it. We're not going to necessarily go and look for it. That, that's not what we want to do. We understand that there's a need for it. But if it impacts us financially, it impacts the district financially, we have an obligation to bring it to you and, and kind of share with you what impact that is going to have potentially. No, we definitely appreciate the dialogue. President Weiner, can I ask one more question? Yeah. Shifting gears just a little bit, going back to the guaranteed minimum. Um, so the guaranteed min is 400000 right? 400, yes. 400K. So, because, uh, you know, we talked about, you talked about the California drought, right? But the meteorologists are expecting the El Nino system to come back through and actually fix that. Um, I mean, just like it did in 2000, what was it, 8? And it came in and dropped five years worth of water, right? Um, and so when that, when stuff like that happens and your costs are less than expected, should we expect that we will get, since it is a guaranteed minimum, should we expect that we will get more than that? Absolutely. You know, coming out of the first year, you always see where you're able to run more efficiently. We feel like, you know, we, again, coming in late, four days to turn it over, you know, to basically get it up and running. We've learned a lot this past year. We feel like there are going to be some challenges specifically with food costs, and that's why we've lessened it. But it doesn't mean that's the amount it will stay at. As we get more effective, more efficient as we go through consecutive years, I believe that, yes, your, your return will change. Absolutely. Okay. And, I, I, you know, I will probably give you guys the benefit of the doubt this year on this, but, I mean, a 23% reduction in the guaranteed minimum, that's significant from one year to the next. And so I hope that you guys will look for those uh, operational efficiencies as best as possible. Yep. And, and I wouldn't say it's that either, meaning I just think um, – you know, Higley is just a unique community, and we have to find out what works with our community. And and I get that no matter <laughs> what, you know, what food service company, and um, it, it's just a unique community. So finding that right, there's definitely days that kids have their favorite, and that's you know, that parents are like, okay, can this be the day I buy? You know, <laughs> and um, you know, you have those parents they just buy no matter what, and then you have your free and reduced. Um, but I think the community is definitely more selective than I think coming into it maybe. So I understand that as well. So I really do. Miss Reese, you had a question? Uh, I, it's more for Dr. Thomason. Um, it, it does go back to that fundraising thing. Um, but is it possible to determine what's cash paid and what's account paid? Because everybody I know puts money on their kids' accounts, so they're not coming to school with that cash in their hand. I might be the only cash person, so if you know my kids. <laughs> I mean, okay, because they're bringing the Ziploc bag with 20 dimes. Well, what I'm saying is on those fundraising days, they're still electing to buy lunch because it's on their account, but the cash they are bringing is for that candy bar that they are selling or where it would not have an impact for you. So I would be interested to see what's what's done through accounts that parents are putting amounts on accounts and how many are coming in with cash that day if they're if they're not a regular purchaser or anything like that absolutely vice president reese um i can get those numbers for you but i would suspect that at the middle school and the high school you're going to see more cash students than you would at the elementary school Do you guys but we'll have, have that numbers? those numbers for you but you have access to them? We can pull them from your point-of-sale system and get that for you. What's on account, 
versus what's actual cash transaction. We, we can't get three. I would just be interested to see that if through having these fundraiser waivers and things like that, um, because a kid's not going to skip out on lunch if they have money on their lunch account. They're going to purchase lunch if they have cash specifically to buy that Otter Pop or to buy that whatever it may be that they're selling after school. Now, if the kid's only coming to school with cash, if they're a regular cash person and the parent has sent them to school with their lunch money for the day and they find out it's Otter Pops, then perhaps they may skip on that. But I would be interested to see what percentage um, is billed through account versus um, actual cash just from that standpoint. All right. Thank you. Okay. President Whitener, I make a motion that we approve the for a food service contract renewal for fiscal fi fiscal year 2015-2016 with Southwest Food Excellence LLC. Support. Okay, any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, we have 10.0, oh, any future agenda items? President Whitener. Mr. Hoffman. Uh, Dr. Thomas, this is something I chatted with you at the uh, Chamber of Commerce event, uh, but just to kind of retouch, um, I would like, as we move into this next school year, just a breakdown of enrollment, um, not only by site, but I'd also like to see which students um, are open enrollment uh, within the district, right, from one school to another within Higley. Um, but also open enrollment outside the district. Um, and then one other category, which is open enrollment from outside the district that come with our staff. Um, I'd just like to see those numbers. Maybe maybe it's once we get in, maybe it's you know the 25 or the 50 day mark or something like that. But just kind of put it on your radar for the fall semester sometime. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, those first three uh, areas you asked for will be easy to figure out. We would have to do a staff poll to figure out which students came with their parents within the district, but that would take us some time to get that, but I can get that for you. Okay. I, th I think that's good. I, I actually think that's a pretty beneficial stat to know um, because obviously, you know, if our if our staff is, is choosing our district, that's important for us to be able to know and tout, so. Absolutely. Any others at this time? Uh, President Whitner, um, just last week I was up in uh, British Columbia and I went on a tour of the Royal British Museum up there, and there was uh, they had a display of Native American. Uh, sorry, I was in Canada. The Native population there, and I, I just want to share with you one of the sayings that I saw on the wall at the entrance. And I just thought it was so profound. Something that was written 500 years ago. How applicable it is today, and I just want to share it with my fellow board members. And it's taxons prove that every single action or decision that a human being makes is actually a moral one. Over and over, taxism proves that selfish behavior is ultimately destructive for both self and society. And I thought, wow, they did this like five, six hundred years ago, and it's so applicable for today in the decisions that we make and what we say here. So I just wanted to share it with you. Hey, Greg, I, I missed the first word. Uh, was it? it um, it's the name of the, the uh, tribe. It's taxism. Okay, thank you. Taxism. All right. Thank you. I move that we adjourn tonight's meeting. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.